Hello and welcome to the Rhizone Podcast. I'm your host, William Clausen. We all know that the horticulture industry is struggling with a declining consumer base. So today I sat down with Jeff and John from Brands and Blooms and we discussed the whys, the hows, the whats, and more importantly, the solution. And they do have a solution. Here's my fascinating conversation with Jeff and John. Alrighty, welcome Jeff, John, welcome to the uh, Rhizone Podcast. Um, so you're, uh, thanks for joining me in studio. Yeah, thanks for having us. Absolutely. I, I just wanted to launch right in. This is going to be good. <laughs> um, so you really uncovered a problem, probably a problem that everyone knows about, but you've taken it to the next level and really done a lot of research and even come up with a solution in terms of the aging demo- the demographic of our buyers, our gardeners and all of that stuff. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, so really ever since I joined the industry, so really for the last seven, eight years, We've been hearing from garden center owners, garden center staff, how are we going to attract the younger generation into our garden centers? So that, that question has continued to come up year over year. And then really in 2020, when COVID hit, that answer was, was actually answered. And we thought it was answered for good, but it was really temporarily answered. And so all of a sudden we added 18, maybe 20 million new gardeners into the U.S. alone and hey we were all high-fiving in the office we thought we made it we thought we'd we'd arrived as an industry and we were smooth sailing now for the next I don't know 40 60 years depending on those new new gardeners that got in how old they were and then all of a sudden in 2022 23 and now 24 we we realized uh uh-oh they're gone again (laughs) yeah so so just to put a little bit of background to that there has been an obviously the whole demographic we know that across every industry is aging because of the 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 greatest generation the baby boom generation they were avid gardeners and garden enthusiasts they were buying a lot going to garden centers buying a lot of product that's not translating into the next generation is what we're is basically what we're saying and we before covid we were already seeing that correct yeah and is it is it a large problem is it like like 100% 100% like 50% down like what's the, what's the kind of numbers that they're talking or that we know yeah and and the numbers I'm, I'm not sure what the numbers are from a percentage yeah. standpoint but we know that lives are busy people are busy they don't have as much time and they still want a beautiful looking garden and so what what we've seen is um, when people were stuck at home during COVID well they had lots of time they had, they had lots of time to garden they were almost forced to garden <laughs> And then all of a sudden, everyone was let loose again, and that time evaporated and went away. And we, as an industry, we didn't do a good enough job to keep those consumers with us. And as a confession, uh, I was one of those who came to garden centers, walked around, uh, a little lost, but following my wife around because she had a newfound love of plants. And uh, as we got a few, in the house, I soon realized that this was like keeping something else alive, and we were having a hard time with our three kids during COVID, keeping them alive in our little, you know, house there without being able to leave. And so, to bring in more life into our house was a chore. And now, I guess with time, we're realizing like it, these plants take time and nurturing. And so, we didn't know how to do it. Do they need lots of water? Do they need a little water? Do they need full shade? A little shade? I wish I knew that going in. Right. And so we're a little intimidated now to get our next wave of plants. And so maybe that's uh, helpful for you to understand, like, this is maybe why they're not coming anymore, because we brought a lot of plants in and not a lot of plants are still around anymore. But there was a, a clear push to do something different around the house. And plants, probably easier than doing your kitchen. So it probably seemed pretty appealing at the time. But Yeah, and really that big question of why. Yeah, Where yeah. did they go? Why did they leave? Absolutely. And, and even, I, I guess, one of the questions I have is, so you said, like, did these people suddenly become plant enthusiasts or were they always plant enthusiasts? Just COVID gave them that opportunity to do it. Like, is, is that something you've, you've looked at? Because clearly you just don't develop a love for plants right. overnight and say, oh, I'm going to do that. Was it because we now had time to do it and innately we still love plants? Or because yeah. often I hear people say, oh, I'd love a plant, but I kill right. them all the time. Right. Yeah. Well, I think you just nailed it with that comment right there. And so, and, and I'll dive into that a little bit with the dissertation that I did, yeah, really trying to answer that question of where did they go? Why did they leave the industry again? Mm-hmm. And, and so when I, when I asked that question and I actually went through, I did a small qualitative study and I sat down with, in a focus group with female millennial homeowners. 
And I picked female millennial homeowners because when I was interviewing garden center owners, they all said that women come in and make decisions on buying plants and men come in and make decisions about the grass. So that's how much our wives trust us. You can, you can handle the grass, which if you're anything like me, there's a lot of weeds in the grass. Um, but, but an important calling nonetheless. But, but, an, important, but an important calling nonetheless. That's right. And so that was the focus group. Mm -hmm. And then from w within that group, um, really, really tried to attack that question and, and figure that out. And it's interesting, every single participant in the focus group said, I love plants, they're beautiful. I'm constantly looking up plants. And then a small, a small percentage of that group actually went in to buy plants. And so then digging in deeper to that, it was exactly what you just said. They kill plants and then it's too expensive to just buy them. And then I think during COVID, they got a little bit of a taste of that. Hey, you know what, I'm stuck at home. I'm gonna create a beautiful landscape, beautiful home, because I'm here all the time. I'm gonna buy all these plants. And then I think they, they likely had a negative experience because they're gone. So you, you, you mentioned your dissertation, so you went, obviously, is that the qualitative study you're talking to or was there about, or is there more research that you did in that area? Yeah, that was the quali okay. qualitative study that I, I was referring to in the dissertation. And, and is this response, so we're talking about, you launched something called Brands and Blooms, um, which is basically, you know, the, the result of the research that you did. Tell me a little bit more about, so what did you find and what, how are we coming to a solution there? Like what's... Um, yeah, that's a great What's question. Out of that? So when I did the dissertation, I really just had curiosity to solve that problem and brands and blooms didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And so even, even before that, finding that problem in the market, I just really wanted to find out where did they go after COVID and how do we get them back? Yeah. And so through that focus group, I really understood that there were, there were two main pillars that came out of that, two criti critical elements, and that was we need to do a better job at educating and inspiring consumers. So when I saw that the majority, how many industries can say that, where the majority are looking up the products and they want to be, they want to buy them, but there's just that roadblock of, I kill them. And because I kill them, they're too expensive. So then I started researching other companies and other retail companies and looking at what they do. And you notice a, a distinct characteristic. When you look up garden centers, Often, one of the first things you see is an About Us page. Here's where we're located, here's our company history, and in some cases, it's pages long of the company history. And then you, you look up some successful retailers out there, like Nike's a great example. You go onto their website, it's a great little video clip of find your feel. It's hiking, it's boxing, it's swimming, it's lifestyle, and then it's inspiring. And then it's customer needs. So then I started looking up the way that, that we do things, within our industry and we're literally sectioning off plants alphabetically by name. We have the most complicated industry or one of them in my opinion. Other than maybe toothpaste? Maybe toothpaste. <laughs> that yeah. comes to mind. Totally. Your... Toothpaste yeah, okay. is definitely in there. Um, yeah and, and speaking of which trying to brush your kids teeth at night time like that that's a complicated issue that yeah, I yeah. still haven't well, been able that's... to solve. Um, but we're, we're, we're listing them off yeah, alphabetically yeah, yeah. And, and then by name. Well, people don't even know the categories. That's right, they yeah. may be, they, they know a hydrangea, they know a boxwood, but that's about it. And so if, if we're gonna continue to list by name and not by lifestyle and need, we're gonna continue to lose. And so mm -hmm. that's, where, that's where that problem was solved is we, we've, you, you hear it all the time. People come into a garden center looking, they, they have a space in mind, whether it's, hey, it's a full shade or a full sun spot. And so why not categorize our garden centers online and in store around front yard, backyard plants. And then within that category, full sun, full shade or partial. And so that's, those were some of the big recommendations. And that's when I went out for dinner with a friend of mine was telling him a few of these recommendations and he was like, you gotta meet John. You gotta sit down with John. And I, I knew John already, but he was like, you guys gotta get together and talk because what you're saying, he literally just did and worked in, in the healthcare industry and he was able to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. And so that's there where John go. came in. And there we are. 
And and so you mentioned these categories and stuff. So is is it as simple as just those categories? Because I would say, if you're doing it by shade, by this or that, I still get confused. Right. So, but you're right. As I walk into a garden center, I need to know exactly what I'm looking for. Right. And then I just scan the plants till I know what I'm looking for because I've had one before and then I go look for it. But to actually, totally. other than that, there's probably about 72 names in between that that yeah. I have no clue what they would be good for, how quickly I would kill them or anything right. like that, right? Yeah, and so w when you think about the different sections and, and you think about things that work really well in an other industries, it's what's new and hot in the market. Okay. And so to have a section when you walk in a garden center or the first thing that you see on a website around what's new, what's hot, and then within that category, breaking it down by full sun, full shade, and partial, I think you're gonna see a few different things. You're gonna see a consumer who now has more trust. You're building their education and, and now they trust where this plant is going to survive and live. And so it, it, does, it does that. And then it also is gonna free up garden center staff. So they're not constantly having to walk around and showing people, hey, actually, where you see the sun, those are the sun plants. Because mm -hmm. we do it anyway in garden centers. Yeah, we, yeah. we organize it that way, but we just don't make it clear. Okay, other than grabbing the tag, flipping it over, wiping the dirt off of it so totally. I can read it, and then totally. and saying, then we, where, where do I put this? Right, yeah. and when you think about it, so again, the consumer study, so many people, almost every participant said, oh yeah, the first thing I do is read the tag. Well, you're not gonna be selling a lot of plants if someone's got 20 <laughs> minutes to buy plants and they have to read every single tag. It's math, yep. it's math guys. I'm not a mathematician, yeah, but. Yeah, yeah. And they were doing the research before, uh, like out online. So does your, does your garden center have the information for someone who's just gonna be scrolling for a while doing their pre-research before they ever walk in? Because I think that's the thing, is the new front door of the garden center is not the actual front door, but the website. And so the website has to be positioned to reflect uh, actually what's actually inside. On. They have to match. There can't be a breakdown there, yeah. right? Or else it's going to break down the trust. There. They have to match. And, then, and you could put in a category of hydrangeas because that is the one plant that everyone kept talking about and wanting. So that was a big piece of it. Um, you, you could even put a section. Another, another huge insight was you could have a section around um, native plants. You could have a section around... Um, pollinators was a big piece that came out of there. Critter-proof plants came mm -hmm. up. So those were some of the major categories. And then even John, with his experience, he, he's built this in other industries, but just having a customer success station. I mean, you have it now on websites where you can have, um, I saw one the other day, a greenhouse grower in Ontario had um, a little chat bot on there. Helping, helping people out. Um, you could have the same thing there, but also in store. So having a customer success station with testimonials and teaching them, here's how you dig a hole. Really making sure that that educational piece is there, running your courses out of there, because a lot of garden centers do a great job at running courses. Yeah. So just leading them down that journey and, and path online and in store. So how do you do that with so many different variables, I guess? Like, uh, and, and of course, maybe we're heading right into what the, some of the solutions that you've come up with is if I'm looking at Nike, for example, I know I'm going to, I have a lifestyle. I want basketball, shoes, baseball, whatever I'm doing. Whereas if I'm in plants, I've got many overlapping pr properties like sun and critter proof and easy right. to take care of and yellow blooms. Like, so where do you, where do you bring all of those hundreds of categories together? Right. That, that's kind of the piece that's going through my mind. Yeah, it's a great question. And, and one that, I mean, each garden center is going to have to answer that themselves and depending on what plants they're bringing in. But I think focusing on bringing in plants that look great would, would be kind of step one. And then if, there, if there's overlap, I think that's okay. You, you see it all the time in other industries where you'll have um, a display on an end cap and you'll also have it down the, the aisle that it's, it's always in. So I think it's okay to have it in multiple areas and that just speaks on the, the plant and maybe even the demand of the plant. If it's a high selling plant because people are coming in constantly for pollinators, well, why not have a pollinator section mm -hmm. in addition to having them in a full sun area? I don't think that you're gonna lose having them in multiple areas, yeah, yeah. but I think you can only win at showcasing some of the plants that people are asking about, constantly yeah, yeah. thinking about when they walk into a garden center. 
So you're so you're recommending that the each garden center would set it up the way they want to, or is there like an industry wide change that you're you're pushing for in this in this area? Yeah, I mean, to a degree, each garden center could. I mean, they're going to have to set it up themselves, and and really, it sound it, it might sound easy when I'm saying it, and and you and I both know that it's not. There are so many complexities of of a garden center of what it looks like of yeah. crossover with plants, and and with really with with your footprint. So every foot, footprint is going to be different. So you can't just design a cookie cutter template and plug and play. But that's just where you have to really look at the space that you have to work with and what's currently set up. Mm -hmm. and, and just really from a clear perspective, like I know, I know John can really speak on this from a marketing perspective and from story, a story brand perspective, mm -hmm. if you want to dive into how you should set up, what are the deliverables that you need mm -hmm. versus what are some areas that you Yeah, the space I think is, yeah. is unique for everyone, but I think building the, building the store, because that seems to be where we're focused on, I would say the website would, yeah. would be similar, yeah. but I would say start with the solution that people are coming for. Because I mean, you're showing up with a problem over your head mm -hmm. looking to solve it. How do I get the right plant to fill this space? And just making sure that the pathway for the customer is set up intentionally for their journey so many times we set up for convenience or yeah. what what plant is uh, do I have to you know the heaviest so I don't have to push it as far or yeah. or whatever or which one needs the most water what in needs, a yeah and closer to the hose or whatever <laughs> or just the way we've always done it before I just think sometimes we we set these things up and with generations it just gets done a certain way and it's just that's how we do it but I like what we're talking about today is how do we do it intentionally with a customer in mind because at the end of the day that's what keeps keeps our businesses going is having customers and customer success. So if you have more success at uh, retailer A than you do at B, you're going to tell your friends about A and then you're going to get some more momentum. So I think what we're really proposing is think through the customer journey to start. That has to be the, that has to be the commitment. Otherwise, just doing it the way it's always been done is not going to work anymore. So think about what problems are, are when people show up, what problems are they um, needing salt that day yeah. and how do we get them from problem to solution and so th thinking about it it's as Jeff has given us categories of uh, you know what goes in this spot of my, my house and if you are talking to 10 different customers and it turns out they're all asking the same thing then feature it more yeah. right yeah. so we have to know our customers as well to know how to set up and that's why I think the consulting part of what we're doing is very helpful because it's actually about listening to you and saying well what What's your business? What are you f focusing on? What are you featuring most? What are you known for in your community? And how do we leverage that rather than just a cookie cutter? You have to have a, this certain space or whatever. But that said, there are principles that, that will help. And I, we'll get into that problem. Yeah, yeah totally. and I want to get back to some of those. But So I'm curious, just so Brands and Blooms is that consulting piece that you're talking about? Is that, is, so there's, there's kind of a, obviously you have the research that's publicly available. Yep. We're talking about it here. There is, there are some solutions, but then there's, well, how do I actually implement that? So where does, where does the the topic we're talking about and the the monetary business that you're running, where where's that line kind of find itself? Just just for clarity for the listeners and stuff as well. Yeah, totally. And and Brands and Blooms really were on a mission to redefine garden centers so that they can attract the new generation of consumer into their garden center. Yeah, yeah. So that's our mission. And what like the main piece of what we're doing would be um, a course actually that we've we've just built, and it's geared towards helping garden centers attract those new generations into the garden center because that was the biggest problem yeah, is they're, they're actually not getting in there. Forget about you can design it any way you want, but it's really the online piece that's stopping them from going in yeah. because trust has not been built because their education isn't there mm -hmm. and they're not inspired. So because they come to a website that tells them that they've been around since 1905 and they grow these great plants and that's where it kind of stops. Right, and the website looks like it's from 1905. <laughs> and, and, and you can download an availability list, I'm sure. That's right, totally. So I, I think that we're doing a disservice to our amazing industry yeah. by, by not changing with the times yeah. and attracting the new generations yeah. to actually go into the garden center. Yeah. And so what, what John and I have built with Brands and Blooms is really a six-week course geared towards, the whole course is geared towards helping garden centers attract new generations. So week one, we're, we're gonna talk about consumer behavior, mm -hmm. um, all the research that's been done. Week two, we're gonna dive into websites, search engine optimization, 
week three. Getting um, your story right too, I think, would be important as part of that. So the yeah. foundational, because right. if you don't have the story, then you don't have anything to put on the website. So whose story are we talking about? Totally. The customer story, and that we'll, okay. we'll get into that. Yeah. I want to talk about that in a minute, yeah, yeah so for sure. Keep going. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going to discuss blogging, why that's important. How do you how do you utilize that effectively? Um, we're going to dive then we're going to dive into the in store layout and how it can complement your online store. And again, it's not going to be that part's not going to be perfect. It is, as you mentioned, such a complicated industry with so many different plants, thousands of plants in a garden center, and so it's going to be very difficult to arrange everything the way that we just talked about it. Yeah. But just just doing your best to try to make every section clear for the consumer, I think is the most important yeah. piece. And having some of those key sections like what's new and hot, because people are coming in for those new and hot items. Um, and, and then some of the, again, doing the market research within each area geographically to figure out what is important to that area. Yeah. Is it natives? Is it pollinators? Is it hydrangeas? Is it privacy? Um, so again, talking about that in the course. And then another key piece is training. So sales training, garden center staff training. It's interesting. Um, I, I go into a garden center all the time now because I'm in the industry. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't get approached that often, actually, by staff. And there, since being in the industry, when, when you do go in there, even on your own, I'll start selling plants to people. And I'll start telling, hey, what are you looking for? Which area are you, are you putting this in? And all of a sudden, oh, I just sold 20 plants in 45 minutes just by asking those simple mm -hmm. questions. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, hey, by the way, um, you're, you're putting this plant in here. Do you know that this actually tracks these bad bugs? But if you if you add this plant, it's gonna attract the good bugs that are gonna, gonna kill the bad bugs. So just some up, upselling opportunities that I think would be some, some great, yeah, yeah. lead to some great discussion. I think if you hang out with Jeff long enough, you start to realize like you can develop a passion for plants. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's healing my, you know, killing of plants before and it's vindication to I'm working on you. Yeah, we're yeah, not yeah, there yeah. yet. But that's what there. that's what being in, you know, in contact with yeah, with Jeff does. And so he's had this now, you know, very ex excellent education, huge investment of his time, but he's only one person at this point. And so our if we're going to have this grandiose mission, you got to think how are you going to do that? And I think it's through getting champions in every garden center. Because there's so many applications, right? We're going to talk website, we're going to talk about social media, we're going to talk about uh, client education, we're going to talk about in-store layout, all that, if we just do it for you, you're not going to get it. And exactly. the mission's going to just be as long as you're paying your monthly bill. Exactly. Yeah. But if we can build a champion in every retailing location, whether it be executive or just someone on the floor who gets it, right? And you can start a movement that way. So we've thought about it a lot. Like, do we just want to hire for services? No, we want to educate first. Yeah. And we want to do it in such a way that it's not cost prohibitive or time prohibitive. Yeah or location prohibitive. So you don't have to come in. It's just going to be done on Zoom as interactive as possible. I want to get everything that Jeff and I know about marketing and next gen, you know, specialization with engagement and impart it to somebody in some organization so that we can then talk about website and we can then talk about how you're going to engage on social media and how you're going to do your in-store layout for next gen. So you're basically following your own <coughs> mantra here is that we need to know your story so we can take and right. re rewrite. Totally. Story. That's right. yeah. It has to be individualized in that way and it has to be in the heart of, of a leader in a company or else it's just not going to, it's not going to translate. They're just depending on us to do, just do your, own, your marketing. Right. And the, the, the places that we've talked to so far have said, the thing that we like about you is that you actually know our world. Because if you hire your nephew to do your marketing or... Uh, you know, a local agency, they're not going to have experience with knowing the difference between annuals and perennials, right? So if you have someone on the inside that can already translate some of that into digital resources, then you can outsource some because we're not expecting everyone to be totally. writing their own website copy or doing all the blogging. Maybe they do want to, but we're all quite busy. So if you can get some help from someone who knows the industry, it, it certainly helps. Yeah. So. It's true. We were just on a, on a call the other day with a client on the East Coast Garden Center and the brother-in-law is doing the website and posting photos of perennials that are actually actually annuals and so hey we want to help so we can do one of two things we can either educate your team members and we can also do it for you yeah so just that ability to offer offer the yeah. course 
but your real goal is education and of course you're, you're because there's so much to do there there's obviously a market there but the real goal is not about oh we need your we need your monthly subscription and then you're part of this uh, this brands and blooms movement correct yeah so so to go back to you mentioned um, and I know you, you briefly outlined the course there and what you're all doing let's to dive back into how we got here um, was the garden center industry always this way that we would just assume someone would come in and know what they what they need to buy? Like, were was the previous generation, if you will, that knowledgeable that they knew what to buy, or is the complexity just kind of crept in? Because mm. think about toothpaste to bring that up again. Fifty years ago, there was right. one. Now I have no clue which one right. to grab, and I'll just grab the cheapest one. I have no clue what. Um, even though they try to say this is for cavities, yeah, well, we all have cavities. This is for this lifestyle, but it doesn't. It doesn't seem to work in that industry. So, has it just crept into this industry, or, or how did it? How did we get here? Yeah, it's interesting because the the older demographic, when I speak with them, and I even speaking to them about brands and blooms, they still say, "Oh, I would love, I would love to know." Mm what where the full shade full sun partial sun plants are so even for them they're still reading the tags yeah yeah. so they're hey they still need education so it doesn't just help the new generation and generations Mm -hmm. that are coming up into the garden center it's actually helping everyone yeah so i think that the older generation it's not that they had more time maybe they had a little bit more time it feels like they had more time life's (laughs) pretty busy right now but yeah um, i think it was just part of their lifestyle yeah like, they didn't yeah. have their kids in, in spring hockey and like, right we like <laughs> we're gonna garden like gardening yeah. is a big part of our life yeah. and I think that was just that generation and I think that um, I think that the new generation that has come up they filled it with other outlets especially when they're not successful and you, you really did see that when yeah, yeah. they were forced to garden and have a beautiful yard and we weren't able to retain them and what about the fact that that was pre-social media and even pre, you know, having a website? So, so much before the digital era, you would go in and just talk to people who had all kinds of time. You would have to go see a Brian Minter or something and yeah. he would tell you everything, right? Right, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> I remember one time when I was a kid, I had a question about avocados and the guy at Safeway, which is, a, you know, forget, we miss Safeway. But the, the, the produce manager just sat there and he peeled an avocado with me and he taught me about avocados. Right. And I'm like, that, that that's a bygone era. Where does that happen anymore? Yeah. And I'm sure it's the same with everyone in a labor shortage. You just don't have the time to do that, right? Yeah. You're, yeah. you're so busy working. So th- it's, a, it's a kind of a gift that we have the internet now to do some uh, research beforehand. Totally. Right? And I mean, even, I mean, this is a bit existential, but like with the, the parenting crisis, like parents just aren't teaching their kids as much, right? In the old days, your dad would bring you into the garage and teach you how to, change a tire or change the oil or whatever, but that's not happening anymore. So people are going to YouTube right. to learn how to change their tires and change the oil yeah. if they do it at all. Totally. Which reminds me, I gotta get my old, t- my oil done <laughs> in my truck. But uh, anyways, that's, uh, we're going online right. in the absence of getting trained totally. by mentors and parents and um, people. So you're making sure you're filling that gap. Yeah. yeah. So thankfully we do have social media to fill the right. gap and we do have, you know, the, uh, the company website to, to teach. Yeah. Whereas we didn't necessarily have those before. So or maybe social media is the reason we don't teach anymore because it's easier to go online. Right. <laughs> totally. That would be another discussion. Right? Because just looking at myself too, I, yeah, obviously there's gaps. Uh, my dad was not into vehicles. I am restoring a truck with my mm. son. We use YouTube all the time because I, I'm right. not going to go to. So I, yeah, I got someone who will charge me to call up. But so obviously maybe it's cre- we've created that ecosystem right. ourselves yeah. as well. Yeah. Right? Um, so what would the average, and I guess I'm looking at from my paradigm and stuff, does the average person go online to research the kind of plants they, they want? Like, is there, the reason that alarms me a little bit is because I'm like, the, the selection is just huge. There's right. so many kinds. Right. And it's overwhelming. And, and, and every, every day. It's different. Yeah. And, and so I, I, I know that people are, are going online to look up plants for an area, not necessarily a type of plant. I mean, again, maybe maybe if you're talking about privacy plants or decorative plants, mm-hmm. like I know people definitely look up hydrangeas, yeah. but I think people are just looking up plants. They have an area in their in their garden and they're looking up, hey, where's the closest garden center? Yeah. And they're going on that site and then they're scrolling around. And most sites, if you, if you leave this podcast and go on to different garden center sites, yeah. most are very complicated, complex, and just pretend for a moment that you don't know anything about the industry and yeah. then try to navigate through 
a website. Yeah, oh, it's absolutely. so complicated. It's worse, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you, you mentioned Brian Minter earlier. I'm a big Brian Minter fan. He does an exceptional job at creating the experience, and he really talks about that experience mm -hmm. and creating that experience. And what was really interesting to me, you, you hear it a lot from, from different buyers of garden centers that the, the younger generation, the new generations, the millennials, they don't want to spend time in the garden center. They just want to really, they, they'd love to just buy online if they could trust it, yeah. um, but they just want it done quickly. And what was interesting is a, in, in the focus group that I did, a small majority went into garden centers from that study but the ones that did said the reason why they love going to garden centers is because it's like going for a walk in the park and they'll spend all day there. And actually they would drive 45 minutes to this particular garden center that's way out of the way. Obviously it's Minter Gardens. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it, that, that was really interesting to me yeah, yeah. that people, millennials specifically, will make the time to go to a garden center and spend half a day there because it is therapeutic. And so I think even just hitting on some of those health benefits when you think about um, our generation now and scrolling and liking different things, hey, spending some of that time outside gardening and just some of those health benefits that you get mm -hmm. from that, I think just focusing more on, on that, the educational piece, the ins inspirational piece, I think it's only going to help attract new people into our industry and retain them. So do you see that? doing a bigger, better online presence is going to drive more people to purchase online or more people to still go to the physical places? Go to the physical places, yeah. for sure. I think it's going to do both, yeah. but, but definitely go to the physical places because especially the, the newer generation, they're going to look online first. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what the research has shown. They're going to go, go online first. And if you don't give them or at least remove that fear, give them that trust, through education and then inspire them to walk yeah, in, yeah, yeah. you've lost. Yeah, absolutely. And inspiration isn't just about, you know, having a really exciting video with someone that's really ex high on caffeine, just getting really excited about plants. Yeah, yeah. It's really about having great design, right? Clean design and, yeah, yeah. you know, consistent f fonts. Like you don't use all the fonts, you just use two fonts and you don't have all the colors, you use a few colors, three colors and you pick them and then you use that and you space things out so it's not super cluttered and just make it easy to navigate and just things like that are so simple but they're inspiring to people that's why apple does it that's why nike mm -hmm. does it and that's why we are in the garden center world have access to those same that's kinds so of thinking awesome. yeah. Yeah. so it's uh, just those simple things that will inspire rather than make us cringe mm -hmm. and the cringe factor on many websites uh, results in lost business because uh, people go somewhere else that just is a little more inspiring yeah. because they use those principles. So. so so, tell me a little bit more as we talk about inspiring is is how do you weave the concept of a story into this? Because I know you've talked about story yeah. branding and, mm -hmm. and things like that. So how does that play? Because a lot of people would say we are telling a story, but clearly they're not telling the right story. So where, where does that lie? Right. Yeah, if you've ever hung out at a party and talked to somebody who is just all about themselves or their kids, right? Uh, they just talked about how great they are, their high school achievements, or maybe their kids' high school achievements. You talking uh, about me right now? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about your high school yeah, achievements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah. makes for a really good podcast. That's right. Um, and you know, they just talk about themselves. And you're just like, when can I get out of this conversation? You go back to, the, to your spouse and say, hey, I just met the most arrogant, narcissistic person. Let's never talk to them again. Mm -hmm. Or you maybe not say that explicitly, you just think it. But then you meet somebody who's very interested in you and they just can't stop asking questions and they're responsive and they're asking follow-up questions and they just you just feel like you've met someone. The principle is that interest dead is interesting. We are naturally drawn to people who are interested in us and care about us and we want to talk to them more. And it's the same thing with businesses. Businesses can are customer centric. Without customers, a business doesn't exist. Yeah. The problem with is that businesses get so high on themselves and their success and their awards, they can't help but talk about it. Unless sometime they sit and someone says, hey, you know this principle about people is the same in business. If you get so full of yourself, it's going to repel people. You think it's drawing them in, but it's actually pushing them away because that's just human psychology. So the story that most businesses have to tell is not their founder's story. It's not the generational succession story. It's the customer story. And the customer story is this. Homeowners uh, or you know anybody with any kind of area they need plants with, uh, or garden owners uh, have a problem 
and there's that problem is keeping them from getting what they want. What do they want? They want it, you know, people to say, where did you get those plants from? Or your house is so beautiful, or this is inspiring your garden. I love watching you in the garden. Or maybe they want a, uh, you know, a garden that uh, yields lots of food for them and their family. And th that's something that they really want. It's, it's driving them throughout the day. But the problem is, they don't know how to do it. They're, they're killing plants and they're not getting any yields from their home garden. Uh, they're stressed out. The thought of a garden or plants actually causes them more pain than it does joy. And that's a major problem. So that's, that's keeping them up at night. The desire to have a beautiful garden or a beautiful home with the right plants is, is driving them forward, but in the nighttime they can't sleep because of it. So the garden centers or, uh, who, or anyone in horticultures, their job is to help the customers get over that hump so that they can enjoy it and making that story clear, right? So talking about the problem and then telling them there's a happy ending once you overcome it. And that's how all stories are really, um, the, the stories that grip us are always about a main character who has a desire, there's a problem keeping them from it, and someone comes along and helps them get rid of that problem so that they can get to their happily ever after. The, the resource that I would highly recommend is building a story brand by a guy named Don Miller. I've been working with them for seven years. And it's just a fantastic book because it's so intuitive to the stories that grip us, right? Those major epics, Lord of the Rings, Frodo wants to go to, um, wants to, go to the Shire, but uh, he's blocked by this, you know, Middle Earth is being taken over. He needs to get this ring to uh, Mordor, but he doesn't know how to get there. Thankfully, Gandalf is there to help him get over that problem so that he can get to Mordor to keep the Shire beautiful. And over and over we could go through all of these epic classics. But that's the story that we're telling is the customer story to make a long answer to your short question. So, and, and clearly, yeah, like you said, the websites don't show that where as we walk into a garden center, yes, it's beautiful, but it's not my story. It's right. not, it doesn't help me, it actually creates my problem worse. Totally. I, I, I'm in a real conundrum now. Yeah, I've even seen websites that just dive right into feature benefit, feature benefit, feature benefit, mm -hmm. without even addressing the potential consumer. And so that's where it would be impossible for John and I to come up with a template that everyone has to use. Yeah. And, and that's where getting to know that demographic, that garden center, their consumers, hey, what questions are you asking? Are you doing surveys? Yeah. Are you surveying your, your consumers coming in? Are you surveying people that aren't coming in? Because that's really the important part. We, we do a great job of researching active gardeners that are buying plants. Yeah. But are we, are we researching people that aren't buying plants? to find out why yeah mm -hmm. yeah and just addressing maybe even it's okay to address the problem that people might be feeling mm -hmm. right like address the stress that comes in uh that or that comes into your heart when you're thinking about plants or when you're thinking about a garden right and and the more you talk about it the more trust you'll have with someone because yeah, right? they think you you know they <laughs> they know you get them right it shows and you they, understand they them feel, yeah, right that empathy piece yeah so you talked about we have labor shortages, so how does this fit in? It sounds like more work for a garden center. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, if you, I, would, I would argue that if you do it well and you lead the consumer down that journey, I think you're going to need less staff on the floor because it's self-explanatory. People are going to be able to walk in and realize, okay, here are the plants that are going to survive in my front or backyard in a full shade spot. And that's exactly what I had in mind when I walked in. Um, and then you're also setting up the customer success station so that if people do have questions, it leads to that. So labor is never going to go away in terms of labor shortages. That, yeah, that's, yeah. that's been a buzzword for the last, I don't know, decade. Yeah, or more. It's, yeah, it's not sure. going away. It's only getting harder. And so that's, that's another important piece that we're trying to find ways to give garden centers tools to succeed. So we're, we're starting with our course. Yeah. And it's six weeks and it's an hour each week. I mean, the commitment isn't massive and we feel the ROI is going to be really big yeah. and a great opportunity. And then from there, we're also working on individualized courses that can help lead to success for garden centers. So whether it's training, um, plant knowledge geographically, just like a full on onboarding training for garden center staff. So that one of the one of the biggest pieces that comes up when we talk to garden center owners is, I don't have time. I have no time. Training's difficult. So we're working on building and working with garden centers to to figure out what are the non-negotiables. What do you need when you're training your garden center staff? 
and, and starting to build out online training yeah, yeah. for them so that we can fight that labor shortage. One more thing to the labor, I know you probably want to jump no, in, absolutely. but um, the, the gift of AI to, um, to the community these days is such mm -hmm. that you can put a little chatbot on the bottom of your website yeah. and it can, it can know all kinds of yeah. stuff and you can train it to you know, focus on these plants and, and your setup, and your setup yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's not just using, not just going to ChatGPT for help, but actually going to your chatbot, mm -hmm. and it just lives there on the website yeah. that they can access, even in the store. Yeah. Too right, they just go to the website, and that's why the website has to be consistent with the in-store experience Absolutely. because you don't want the, a disconnect. They want to have it seamlessly flow through. This is how. This is the messaging. Isn't isn't there? I, I just read the other day. Isn't there a case now in Canada or the U.S. somewhere where someone's actually trying to sue the company for? I think it's actually Air Canada, hmm. where the chatbot told the person to do something, and they're like, "Well, we're not responsible for that because it was the chatbot, not us." <laughs> and they because yeah, they actually told them to refund their ticket and do this or that, and it's like, but that's not the advice that an agent would have given, but the chatbot. Interesting. Did. So I'm that sure that, inter that opens up a whole new. I'm sure that uh, chatbot will be retrained. <laughs> Sent to reprogramming. But who's school. at fault in the meantime? Right. right. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Clearly, the company's at totally. Fault, but, yeah. Totally. But uh, clearly, someone needs to redefine that. But no, absolutely, and that's the. Uh, we have to give the chatbots and all that that whole industry time to get it where it needs to be too because yep. more often than not I'm still a little frustrated when I'm like no I just want to talk to an totally. agent because clearly you don't get what I'm trying to say. Yeah. A customer support agent would be different than an information yeah. chatbot yeah, absolutely. because yeah, if you can sure. even yeah. see the chatbot as part of your um, customer service team yeah, not necessarily absolutely. processing refunds but answering questions about what yeah. what do you recommend going here yeah. uh, and that just takes some some effort I mean I would imagine that just the thought of having a chatbot on the bottom of your website is um, mind-blowing and far-stretching to some, but certainly not going to be, it's going to be industry standard very soon. Totally. And that's why we think if we can, because I mean, we could do a whole talk about chatbots or AI, mm -hmm. right? But if we can train a champion in every, um, in every store to then start to implement these principles, um, you know, and gr I let it grow, then that's, that's our only hope. Otherwise, uh, it's going to be tough to just apply everything that we right. want to do to help and like you're, you talked about the website SEO and all that stuff like search engine optimization chatbot is part of that whole piece too you guys talk about that as well sure. as, as brands in bloom or is that yeah. in blooms or is it something that yeah it, it's kind of like you said you need you need to get a champion who then will drive this well one of the world. sessions that we would do and certainly um, you know happy to talk about it here but it's just making your website Google friendly yeah, exactly. so you know that Google has a customer base that they're trying to help and if yeah. if Google is recommending people sending people to your website and it's not um, providing answers to questions that they're looking for or if it's not uh, user friendly then people are going to say Google why did you send me here like this is terrible then they'll go to Yahoo or Bing or someone else right so Google knows it has to protect its customer base so it's always looking for the best uh, responses to the queries that are given it so if your website is answering questions and in a user friendly way and Google's tracking right like oh this these people are spending lots of time on this website when when we sent them there versus we sent someone there and the page didn't even load for three seconds, they bounced. Okay, well, whenever well, we won't send them again, yeah, bury them onto page yeah, three, yeah. which is the best place to hide a dead body, by the way, on the page <laughs> two or three of Google because no one will ever find it. Exactly. And so just having a, a user-friendly, Google-friendly website would be something that we would just talk about for a while and then give people, you know, here's a list of things you can do to make your website more Google-friendly so when people are looking for you, they're not going to the yellow pages. Yeah. They're not driving around town. They're doing a search yeah. on their phone. So that's a huge part of, of reaching the next gen is, is being able to know how to be Google friendly and SEO is part of that. And I would say most companies have great information. So if, if you have a chatbot and you open them up to the entire internet, hey, that can be a dangerous place and maybe that's where <laughs> yeah. Canada led. <laughs> yeah. but, it, but if you have a certain area that that chatbot can play in and you've actually fed that information in, then it's still your information, it, yeah. but then you're using it to your advantage. So you trust the information, you know what, where it is, and then you're, you're still leading that, that consumer yeah. through yeah. what you've So created. maybe it was giving WestJet's policy when it should be. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> true. So, um, so we're, we're, we're really talking about garden centers and the website and, and retailers. How does the growing industry, like the, 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 the nurseries and the, the, the growers, what, what's change, what would change for them in this paradigm? Yeah, I, I just feel that everyone wins in this situation. And so I think that like right when we launched this thing, I got 
my phone started ringing. I got phone calls from people that sell the garden centers and have been for over 30 years. And they were like, Jeff, I love this. You and John have built something really special and I want in. And so I think that's, that kind of speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you have people that are in the industry selling to garden centers, have been for 30 years, and they, they believe in what you've just done, it, it shows that this is the problem. This yeah. is a huge yeah. problem in the industry, and if we can solve it, then every single nursery that sells to garden centers will win. So that's, that's what I wanted to say about yeah. that. Does the growing industry, one, one thing I've, is, is there's a lot of R&D happening. There's always new products coming out. Yep. Is, is, that, is that helping the problem or making it worse in terms of like the, the, the brand or the variety, the cultivar that I took, grabbed two, three years ago, there's now a better one. And, and do I trust that better one? How does that play into it all? Yeah, I think, I think you're seeing that a lot. You're seeing so many new varieties come in. So the new and hot section could actually be bigger. You just flip it and just have... Um, the new and hot section be your entire garden center <laughs> with, with how many new plants are coming pretty out much, these days. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> yes, it is. So I, I think that it does start to hurt the industry. Um, I think that especially if you, you have it laid out just everywhere yeah. and it's not organized mm -hmm. well, I think if you color block and you keep the material together, I think consumers are going to walk into a garden center and they're going to notice those big color block stations and areas because it gives them that trust. I think it all comes down to trust. Mm -hmm. And so if they yeah. see a section with hundreds of plants and they're cookie cutter and they're beautiful, I think they'll be drawn to that plant. Whereas I think if they walk into a section and there's hundreds of plants to choose from, they're gonna be overwhelmed, they might not know what plant they want, yeah. and they might leave without yeah, a yeah. plant. So is that more on the garden center then to make sure that they become the experts on what's really good for their area and their and their zones and things like that? Absolutely. Because I would I imagine that it's not a grower's intention to make it more complicated. Right. Their intention is to find a better product for that zone, for that area, for longer blooms, you name it, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So so what what what, what uh, can we give to the garden center owners to become better at that? Is there a similar movement that happens on the grower side to say, hey, garden center owners, we'll help you become better at the industry the same kind of way? Because are our growers thinking about the story of the garden center owner who has to now choose between seven new varieties next year? Which one right. do they choose? They're not going to give seven to their, right. to their clients. Totally. I, I think it, it comes down to trust. So the nurseries that do a great job that I know about they're growing great plant material and they're vetting out those plants. So if there's new plants being introduced, they're not gonna try all of them, they're gonna try the winners, the mm -hmm. clear standout winners, mm -hmm. and then they're not gonna sell them into garden centers until they've grown them on for a year and see them looking great. And the best account managers that sell in the garden centers, they're gonna take photos of, hey, here are the, this new crop of hydrangea cherry go round by Bloom and Easy, and they look great right now. So shameless plug. ship them in. That was a shameless <laughs> plug. I couldn't help myself. I held back for a pretty long while. Yeah. It was pretty good. Um, and, and they're going to ship them in. They're going to take a photo of the, the crop and the, the garden center is going to give it a try. But I think the important piece is it has to look great. Yeah. It has to look great to make it into the garden center. And if it doesn't, then you're just giving the consumer a bad experience. I think yeah, we've yeah. done that a lot over the years with the non-branded material. A lot of those varieties are outdated mm -hmm. and they're actually giving consumers a really bad experience when they go and plant the plant in the garden mm -hmm. because there's better varieties out there. And so I, I think that if, if we could, if we could as an industry stop growing some of those varieties and garden centers would stop ordering them and just trust that if we, if we put the best plants in the garden center and it's gonna take everyone, it's gonna take the brands, it's gonna take the nursery and it's gonna take the garden centers if we can all get on the same page that way, we're going to give the consumer a great experience and then they're going to keep coming back. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Because even, even that, you know, saying, oh, I, I got this nice lavender or whatever it was. And then a grower comes by and says, well, that one doesn't actually grow that well in this area. It's like, well, it was a good deal. I got it for that. And, and that whole story just repeats itself right. over and over. Then they die and then I'm like, why would I buy another one? Right. right. And then you might not come back. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so in terms of the growers themselves, th there's not a massive shift other than, other than you know, just keep providing the best quality products and making sure we're the growers are educating. But it's really this whole movement and, and 
the onus on getting the next generation in is largely on the retailers, but the growers have to back that up is basically what I'm hearing. Yeah, absolutely. And really the garden centers, they're, they're the ones driving the ship. They own all the power. Yeah. And so when you, when you think about some of the biggest brands out there in the market, and then you actually talk to consumers, consumers have no idea who the brands are out there. Yeah. They just go in and they see a beautiful plant and they buy it. And if they see it in a pot and it looks nice, they get more trust from yeah, that, yeah, yeah. that branded pot. But really it's the garden center buyer that, that know about all the brands. And so they're the ones making the big decisions, bringing in some of those top brands into their garden center because we've done a great job marketing to the garden center buyers, not the consumer. Yeah. So, so we're thinking about, hey, how can we, how can we sell these plants in? Because once, once they get into the garden center, we know they're gonna sell, especially if they look great. So how does the, the big box outlet garden centers play into this? Yeah, we really geared this towards the independent garden that's center. That's right, yeah. So that's, that's the mission that we're yeah. on. And that's the image I had in my head when you're always talking about garden centers. But suddenly I'm thinking about the Costco's, the Home Depot's, you name it. People walk in, um, they are going to gravitate towards color. It's all about color. And that's cookie cutter. That's, that's yeah. But isn't that, doesn't that have a huge impact on the industry? Because my experience, <coughs> I'm going to go into Home Depot or yeah. Costco and I'm going to see a beautiful flower there. It's beautiful color, but I'm going to take it home and it dies on me because it wasn't the right, right one for my zone or something. So it d doesn't that have a huge impact on the industry? Because that's often people's first experience. It's less daunting to go into one of those green garden centers. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to have a, a, a huge impact on our, on our industry. And I think that's where garden centers can win that battle. Mm -hmm. They can win that battle. And, and really, the research that we've done, when you look up a plant, you're actually not looking up a plant on Costco and Home Depot. No. You're looking yeah. up a plant at a garden center. That's right. But yeah. then those garden centers aren't showing and giving the consumers enough for them to actually go into that garden center. So they are walking into Home Depot, yeah. Costco, Canadian Tire. And then that's where we've lost them. And yeah. then maybe they're not having as good of an experience because they're not getting educated and it's going yeah, in a yeah, different yeah. spot. Or maybe they're having a great experience. Maybe they're, they're buying deco plants, decorative plants every year and it goes in their patio and it dies and they buy more. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, it's really hard to say. And do you see this going to a place where you, you talked about education and inspiration. Inspiration obviously is how you're going to get them in the first place, but education is is the dream that we get into a place where people will say i want the cherry go round or i want that specific variety and and is that is that the is that where we'll go or is is ai always going to be alongside of us just telling us which one to grab i would love to see a day where like the iphone people know about the consumer knows about some of the new and hot varieties mm -hmm. and, and not because um, not because there's money behind the brand because the plants are the best and I'd love to see a day where consumers walk in looking for a specific plant. I think we're a few years away from that. And I think that if we start with the educational aspects of it, I think then you'll get to that point. But I think that's further down the line. I think right now we're, we're trying to solve that problem of, of really building into that consumer so they, they get the confidence to walk in year over year and know, okay, I can, I can do this, I can garden, I can, and my, my garden looks great. And it actually doesn't take that much work because my local garden center does a great job laying everything out for me, leading me down that journey. And I know exactly what I get when I buy this plant and put it in my yard. Yeah. And do you think too, like you're going after people that maybe wouldn't even be at a Costco or Home Depot, but like a different type of consumer that you could create and turn into a, a raving fan, right? Where, I mean, I heard the expression, like kiss your customers so much that their lips bleed where you are just providing so much value and so much service whenever they come in or visit you on web, your website that they're just always coming in and always telling other people like, yeah, you could have the Costco big box experience, but you could talk to these guys who are my people, right? Because they've helped me every year. I've, they taught and they know this and I'm even a better uh, in brand ambassador now for them because I know so much about the different things and I can give advice and they say, well, who are you? you? We've been friends for years. You've never given me any kind of plant advice before. It's all you gotta, I learned it all from, you know, from my place. And so you're just turning people into raving fans just by uh, loving them so well and giving them these great experiences that they can't help but come back every year where they maybe wouldn't even have been on the radar of Costco or whatever. So 
So are you seeing some tangible results? Yeah, we're, we're definitely seeing some tangible results. It's again, it speaks volumes when we've had, we had the daughter of a garden center owner reach out to us and say, I want to sell for you guys. I, I believe in what you're doing. I grew up in a garden center and I've seen the way that we've always done it and it needs to change. Yeah, yeah. And so that, that really resonates. We launched this thing in the middle of spring. Whose idea was that, by the way? <laughs> that was a yeah. bad idea. Why wait? You know? yeah, Why wait? Exactly. Why wait? Yeah, yeah. So I think, I think the thing that I like get most excited about is how people react to Jeff's stuff, right? Yeah. Is and is that the garden center or like uh, what about the the retail? Consumers right now, we're, we're hearing from garden centers. Yeah, okay. we're, we're like we, yeah. we've had some great interactions with some garden centers that are like, hey, this is fantastic. We love what you guys are doing. And then we're also hearing from nurseries that sell into garden centers, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. When when you hear from um, the, the, the people that sell the yeah, most yeah, yeah. to that mm -hmm. group, it, it kind of speaks for itself. Yeah. And are so you seeing people implementing the, the steps already and, sure. and results on that? or is it Absolutely. I, I had a, a friend of mine who owns a local farmer's market. Again, not plants, but similar mm -hmm. industry. Immediately take those recommendations and implement them right into their business immediately. And, and they've noticed some gains. Yeah, so yeah. I know that... I know that this is going to work. I know that it works. We've seen it in other industries that, that John's been in, mm -hmm. and we're not going to stop until it does. Yeah. And again, the, the, the big thing is just, if we can do a good job educating, and, and just simple stuff, right? We, we could spend a whole six weeks on just website training, yeah. but we're going, to give you, we're going to give garden centers just enough in six weeks to hit on all those topics. Yeah, what if you put a button on your website, just a button that said, you know, buy, buy now or just leave a message about, uh, uh, beside every page or every um, flower you were selling or every plant that just allowed people to click in and then say, I want one of these and then they come pick it up. Like, what could that do to your sales? Could it add 10%? Right, if you just added 10%, who wouldn't love 10% more uh, revenue? Just by putting a button on there. If there's no button, imagine having uh, a store that had no checkout, right? Where you ha went around, you walked up and down the aisles, you grabbed your stuff and it's like, where do I pay for all this? Yeah. And there was nowhere to go. Or someone said, well, you got to go up the stairs, down a the hallway, there's a broom closet, go past that, through another set of doors, and there's a checkout over there. Cash only. Yeah, <laughs> cash only. You're like, I can't do that. Yeah. You drop your stuff and walk away. So just by having a button that says like, buy this now, you don't even have to have an e-commerce set up. Like, maybe that's too much. I think it's industry standard should be but it's not and we'll help you get there if you want but just put a button call up your well, website guy and say get in the way of yeah. That. yeah call That's up your website good. person hopefully they're alive and they respond yeah. too many website people don't respond to emails anymore which is another problem we're trying to solve in the market but say could you put a button on there that says buy this plant right now and I bet you there'll be a huge increase just right away just at the same as I would say to any store like do you have a till and put a check out there Right, um, and I think so. Those are the kind of the instant results, or just talk, start talking to your customers on your website. Don't just talk about yourself. It's a good life principle, yeah. but just change that, and I guarantee you'll start to see an in increase. And those are the kind of things that we just want to start giving a little bit of wisdom and insight from what Jeff's learned about talking to you know, millennials, what I've learned about in years of marketing. If we could just start seeding some of these uh, ideas into the market, I think we're going to start to see those millennials start coming back again because they'll start to get excited yeah. about because the problem hasn't gone away no, exactly. places are still ugly without plants they need to be decorated yeah. you still have dirt that needs to have seeds and gardens in them so that people need to be fed with the price of food yeah. before, before I, I got, got into this industry me and my wife bought our first, first house and our plants were so atrocious that i literally took them all out and we just had no plants and that looked better <laughs> and i didn't do anything for a year i just left it and then I got into this industry and became quite passionate about yeah, yeah. plants. And it's amazing and once we actually landscaped our whole place and I did everything, all of a sudden neighbors are coming over to me. Did you guys renovate your front yard? Did you, did you like redo your siding? Nope, just the plants. Mm -hmm. So it's amazing the power of yeah. planting a beautiful yeah. garden and what it can do to your curb appeal. So what's your, what's your dream or ambition for how long before I can walk into any garden center and, and feel like I'm not in, in a jungle? <laughs> I mean, I always dream way too aggressively and, and big. Well, you went from nothing to an evangelist, so you must have That's some true. dream. <laughs> That's true. I, I, I would say 
if, if we can, the other cool thing that's come, come out of this is um, Floral Daily, Green Profit, um, both published our article that, that we put together. Um, we, we've gotten a lot of um, interest around different trade shows to speak at their event. Um, so we've been offered um, a seat at Far West, yeah. um, the BCLNA, the Canadian um, Nursery and Landscape Association, Garden Center Summit. So we're moving and shaking and hey, we're, we're giving a lot of stuff away for free. Yeah. And we're doing it because we truly believe that if we can educate and, and, and really help garden centers rejuvenate their brand by educating the consumer, inspiring the consumer, then every single person in this industry mm -hmm. is going to win. Yeah. So why now? Like we, We've had this problem for many, many years, decades if not more. Uh, we knew this was happening and you know we've tried patio containers. You can buy a little hanging basket of strawberries or tomatoes. Everyone's trying these things. Why is this it and why now? Why not? that someone came up with this 10 years ago? That's a great question. And I wish I came up with it 10 years ago. <laughs> but yeah, it's a great question. I don't know, it's, it's a really, yeah, it's interesting because every, every single person that I've talked to about this that, that's in the industry gets excited about it. Mm -hmm. And then every person that I talk to outside of the industry gets excited about it. And that gets me excited. Because if, if people were you the one that had to start being excited, so it came back. It came back full circle. <laughs> okay, okay. But, if but, but the clearly, industry, there's some industries that do this already. Right, totally, and they do it really well. And and we just we just haven't gotten there yet. I've, I've I remember eight years ago, seven years ago, um, one of the bigger brands had this idea about like, hey, you walk into a clothing store, clothing department, and it's not set up just with clothes everywhere. It's DKNY, it's Calvin Klein, it was by brand. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great in theory for clothes. And, and it sounded great at the time and, and maybe it helped them sell more plants. And in our industry, it's not solving that problem. It's not solving the problem for the consumer yeah. about I kill plants and this yeah. plant's not gonna make it. Yeah. So I think that's where just writing this dissertation, yeah. do, doing the work, and then really digging in deeper and, and exploring other industries and how they're doing it, and what they're doing, yeah, yeah. how they're winning. And then honestly, it was a bit of a God moment just kind of mm -hmm. meeting with John and then all of a sudden, Brands and Blooms is formed, so. Do you, do you think though that probably with the COVID boom that's, um, that you guys saw, that was part of uh, the excitement and thinking, oh, we've already done it. Like yeah, the torch yeah, has been passed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden to see a sudden drop is quite alarming. Now, many industries saw that drop yeah. huge, right? It's, um, but it kind of, you know, just created that sense of urgency maybe. And yeah. 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 So now all of a sudden it's like, well, we, Hey, we were loving those days. I mean, we hated those days for many reasons, <laughs> but we loved the revenue that brought in. Why couldn't yeah, like we've that, already that shown one year. Yeah. We were, these people showed that they are revenue. They, they'll bring in revenue and they will show interest. So why can't we, and then it just brought up a, a thing that so many industries have to figure out is how do we reach yeah. that next generation. But I think it starts with in your heart as a leader, you have to value that next generation too, yeah. right? I mean, we're millennials. As a millennial, I'm on the early side of millennials. Um, but I was always, we were always laughing stock. Like, oh, you guys are the pictures, mm -hmm. the people that take pictures of your lunch and post it on social media and all yeah. sorts of things about millennials you can't get out of your parents' basement. Well, eventually, you know, our millennials now homeowners with kids, arthritis creeping in, yeah. right? Like they're, they're a powerful generation all of a sudden and gonna start driving much of the economy. That's true. <laughs> that's true. Right, so that's like, you have to value millennials oh, and, and well, emerging generations, we might just say just well, like I would that. say, yeah, because beyond the millennials, we're gonna have the next generation yeah. that, well, we'll just sell them virtual flowers. Right. right. <laughs> Big no, plants. Yeah. But, but I would imagine, like you said, and, and that's why the why now question came out, because every industry struggles with that problem. Like, for example, like maybe buying clothes by brand works for you, but it doesn't work for me because I'm not. I just want clothes that fit well and, and right. look good. I don't necessarily care what brand. So I guess it really depends on what's your customer, right? Because you walk into, in Canada here, for example, a superstore, it, they mainly sell groceries. But if you're going to look for shoes for your kids or whoever, it's all labeled by their section rather than walking into mm. into sport check where I can just go to the shoe wall and I right. get everything from zero to 
15, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's, and give me the sport check anyway, because at least I know all the shoes are there, right? I'm not like, oh, I wonder if there's one under right. that, that shelf over there somewhere oh, yet, yeah, right? Oh. Um, and that's, uh, so I guess every industry struggles with that. And, and maybe this has just been the time of reckoning for the plant industry to say, hey, it's time to pay attention to your consumer because they aren't just going to come to you. Mm -hmm. And yep. you still can always service those who want that cultivar, that species, because they'll come in and ask for it and you'll know where it is. Totally. So, but yet we've geared a whole industry to just those ones who know exactly where it is, right? Right. Totally. Which is really a small percentage of the Absolutely. population. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, the and, and shrinking the more we totally. don't cater to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so if I'm, uh, you know, just as we wrap up here, because we're, we're running out of time a little bit, so I'm sure there's lots more we can talk about, but where do I start as a, as a nursery, as a garden center? What is, how do I start moving down that uh, place of telling the story that I should be telling and, and then, you know, setting myself up for it? I take this one. You take it. <laughs> Brandsandblooms.com. I took Jeff's uh, research and all his recommendations and put it into an easy to use or easy to read bite size checklist. Yeah, brands in blooms. Yeah, brands in blooms yeah, com. So yeah. he did the amazing work. I just took it and said, oh, this, you can do this and you can do this and you can do this. He's a smart one. No, I, you're smart. I just popularized it, made it easy for the rest of us, right? Because I don't read dissertations. I, not, <laughs> certainly not for fun. Um, so yeah, we what, read Jeff's. Yes, yeah, yeah. What passed for his what passed for his Debatable. academic credentials is not going to pass for light nighttime reading. So we just made it to a checklist, which is totally free. So it's all available for free online. You got it. Um, and then I'd say the next step would be if you're interested in that and you realize like, oh, that that first point is interesting. Why did they say that? I'd like to talk to someone about that, and they want to be a part of a group. Then the course becomes very interesting to them probably because. Uh, what they're going to get is a, a cohort that they can talk to and will teach through the material and then there'll be a time for addressing you know massage it into your company and then people are going to come at us in week four and be like hey i tried week one and i have a few more questions about that so that's why i think it's nice to be a part of a group to go through the checklist because it might be lonely or tiring or confusing to maybe just take it all on yourself so we want to support those with a group of people also doing it but also you get access to jeff who's going to teach you through the why uh, we do it. So. so you're saying when I come to brandsandblooms.com, it's going to understand my problem and then it's going yeah, to help right. me through it? The yeah. first, that's right. That's right off the bat. It's Immediately. Just like when I enter a garden center in the near future. That's Are right. you struggling to reach the next generation yeah, of yeah, gardeners? Yeah. Is there anything, and I know you know we've been just talking for the last hour about this, is there anything that I, I may have skimmed over or missed? Because you know, there's a lot of stuff there. I think uh, we probably you know picked a few pieces out here and there. You know, I think if, if I were to dive back into something, we'd probably end up talking for another hour. Okay. And so I, I would just say that, you know what, we, we have such a heart to solve this problem. And, and again, we think that we have the best industry out there. We think it's a beautiful industry and we're passionate about continuing that on for years to come. And so um, the, the biggest piece is just to, to help garden centers rejuvenate their brand and connect with those new generations. That's the biggest piece of it. And then everyone in the entire industry is going to win because of that. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, I'm probably the newest, definitely the newest to the industry. But in my experience so far, uh, just fell in love with the, the beautiful people running these garden centers, right? These families, um, maybe they pass it on to a group that didn't, I mean, they grew up in it, but they didn't necessarily want it. But now here it is, they're running the company. And more revenue, like we talked about, could you just raise 10%? Well, imagine what 10% revenue can do for a family, Absolutely. right? It can, it can pay for vacations that they never had a chance to go on. It could let them to hire another staff member so they could spend more time with their family. So at the heart of it, yes, we're trying to help gardeners, but we're also trying to grow businesses so that families, these great family business owners, owned businesses or whatever, can, can spend more time together, grow their revenue, and, and you know help their communities more. So Tell their story for 10 more yeah, years or 100 totally. more years. So that's the heart of yeah, what we're trying absolutely. to do, and yeah. the, the stuff that we create, the classes that we host, really are with the heart to, to help these companies grow and reach more people. Absolutely. Well, thanks, John. Thanks, Jeff. I, I know we just touched on a few things. There's probably a lot more we could talk about, and I'd love to do that. So, um, yeah, who knows where, where this will lead to a future conversation. Nice. Thank you, Appreciate you having us on. Yes, absolutely. It's been a pleasure. Yes,